This week we head down to the Exumas, Georgetown. We have a beautiful sail, although we push the boat far past our own comfort zone, it gets a little bit hairy. Too fast, Colin, it's too fast, slow down! I catch a fish along the way, beautiful mahi mahi. When we get to Georgetown, I do a little fish butchery 101 on how we fillet the fish, cook the fish, butcher the fish. Skin the fish. Uh, it's quite easy, but if you get it wrong, you take chunks of meat off. So I find the most beautiful beach to have the most exhilarating time on a kite surf. I push myself faster than I've ever gone before. And the girls find a piano with a mermaid seven meters under the water. We meet some of the local fish life population, feed it some food, and just be in awe of these wonderful creatures. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Sailing the Recipe. I'm Colin, and this is my three girls and wife, Bex, and this is our floating home, The Recipe. Together we left home and embarked on a journey of a lifetime. After crossing oceans, we have recently been locked down in Antigua for about eight months. Tune in, hit that subscribe button, and join us every Sunday to see where our recipe takes us next. got our big sail out. We've just left Eletrea and we're heading towards the Exunas. We've got some gnarly weather coming in so we want to get into a nice little quiet anchorage and uh, enjoy the next few days. The washing's up. There's lots of air between. I don't think I'm going to catch any fish today. Uh, I think we're too fast unless the, the fish have got some jet skis on. Baby girl singing her heart out at the front, thinking she's on her own. Got a rock and roll, screaming her lungs out. I'm proper going for it. So cute. She spotted us. She spotted us. Diva. So I'm doing all this work. Oh yeah. You busy? What about you, Muna? You keep them busy? Yeah? Everything's under control, right? She's so happy! <laughs> Olivia, you do realise we're in the Bahamas, right? I mean, you're dressed like an Eskimo. It's a bit chilly! For the Northern Channel or something. It's not by chilly. The way, it's... By the way, guys, this is not mine. This is my father's and um, it is quite an unacceptable yeah. jacket. I but it's that... warm, so it's fine! In Amsterdam, ready for Sweden. It's not for the Bahamas. It's like Taliban. But it's chilly. It's 22 degrees. 22 degrees and windy. I feel like hot chocolate time, cup of tea. What turned out to be a relaxed, speedy sail ended up being a mad, dangerous sail. We pushed the boat far too much, hitting 15 knots, surfing down waves. Everyone was a bit scared. just coming through a cut um, into the Exunas. Um, if any of you have been to the Bahamas, it's wild on one side and then completely calm on the other side, but it's still really wild. And Colin wants to get to this safe anchorage for the wind that's coming in in the next few days. And we're gonna get there in a few minutes. And then it's time for bread. <laughs> bread and soup. Mm. <laughs> and a cup of tea. And a cup of tea and some biscuits. <laughs> We're regretting all the big jumpers now. It's a bit hot now. <laughs> 
Right, we are about two and a half miles away from Grand Exuma. We are going to Georgetown. So I'm just looking at the screen here down in the main salon because it's bloody windy out there. I can't hear myself think, never mind do anything to camera for you guys. So one thing we have to be careful, sailing around the Bahamas, as we all know, is a little bit treacherous. So we have to make sure that we pass rocky, shoaly, reefy places in sunlight or with good sunlight, meaning the sun is kind of like one, two o'clock in the sky, no clouds. So far that's good, it's just bloody windy and rocky at the moment. So what we need to do is look at the charts and see where a good cut is, which is going from the Atlantic side through to um, a, a nice cut through the land where we've got a nice calm anchorage bay on the other side, so the protected side. These cuts are quite treacherous because you've got things like um, a lot of tidal surge coming in, you've got tide coming in, you've got the waves coming in the opposite direction which create a lot of chop uh, and of course a lot of radios going off as well asking for help. So that's what I'm trying to do now, find my perfect cut and, um, and navigate that through in the next kind of half an hour. We're going to have the guys on the front of the, on the, front of the boat looking over because at the moment we are 1,200 meters deep but go two miles ahead and it's like six meters going down to one and a half meters so it's that point that we've got to be very careful with a lot of surge behind us so it's a little bit tricky but I'm sure we can do it What you doing, Mama? It's a bit rocky and rolling. Oh. Just finishing bread because I need soup and everybody needs a nice fresh crusty loaf. shorts up. Got a proper bum cheek shot then. Okay. Filleting fish 101. So this beauty, this is a wahoo. No, it's not. Let's get it straight, shall we? It's a mahi mahi, sometimes known as a dolphin fish or dorado. So I've just caught this about two hours ago. Um, I've let it set it's very important actually, something called rigor mortis. It's a chemical reaction of something when it's dyed, it firms up. And uh, it's a lot easier to fill it when it's had rigor mortis and it's now relaxed. So we have our fish, the things you'll need are a rag, a wet rag, and a sharp knife with a steel. Where's my sharp knife and steel? Two seconds. Okay, so there's two ways of doing this. I'm gonna show you both ways. And the name of the game is not to get any waste. Obviously this beauty here, it's in the sea. We've obviously had him, caught him for our lunch. So we wanna make sure we give him the utmost respect, doing a job properly and getting no waste. So I'll show you two ways to fill it. Uh, and as I do, I'll explain what I'm doing. Let's get started. Okay, so now we've got the fish cleaned up. We'll just put this to one side for two seconds. And we've got a lot of meat here. What I do is I run the knife down here. And I take off this bit. Nice little piece of meat there from the head, top of the head, so again no wastage. 
Okay, so the next step is to make a nice big cut down the back of the spine. Get your sharp blade in the back and run it down with the blade keeping down on the, on the bone. As long as the blade is on the bone, you're not gonna lose flesh. So, straight down, you can hear it clicking. Oh my God. Like that. And you can open it like that, you see? And then you can find where you're gonna go just by running the blade down the spine. You don't wanna pull the pull the fish up too much because you don't want to break the flesh so now the other half so now I've got to the spine here I turn it over and I run the knife down and I make a cut and lift it all up like that lovely so there's one fillet there like that again very little waste here very little waste Okay, two of the things you should know about fish, especially when you come to cook it, is obviously some fish are put into, into groups, like you have a flat fish, a round fish. Obviously, a round fish would be something like a trout or a tuna or a salmon, because they're round. A flat fish, they're flat, would be like a turbot, a place, something like that. Now, the difference is a, a round fish has two fillets, one on each side, as this one does, and a flat fish has four, one on the top, sorry, two on, two on the top and two on the bottom. The other thing to note is you have a oily fish and a white fish. Not necessarily to do with their color, but more to do about their liver. So a white fish has no, that uh, has a liver, as in like a cod. A cod is white fish, it has a liver, cod liver oil. Whereas a tuna or a, a, a trout or a salmon, they are oily fishes, which means they have no liver. And all their nutrients required, all the oils required to give them fuel is in their flesh. They're normally more powerful animals. You know, they think of like a tuna, just explosive power. All the energy, all the oils in its flesh to give explosive power and it needs it. Whereas a, 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 a cod is more of a, and, and a haddock is more of a grouper, more of a, a lazy kind of feeding, bottom feeding fish, just need that explosive power. Um, when you come to cook these, Two different ways obviously cooking something like an oily fish like a like a salmon you don't need so much oil in the pan it, it's a naturally oily fish uh you don't need to put so much flavor in your dressings in fact you might need some acidity to cut through some of that oil uh, whereas a white fish you know roasting it with lots of butter is just delicious so the next part to feed uh, to cut this one up is i'm going to show you another way by separating pre-separating the fillets so already I think I've talked about this before, but Mother Nature has made a line down the side of the fish to show you where to fill it. And if you run your knife along this line here, well, there we go. You've split the two fillets. Basically, that, that line through here, if I show you this way, is this line along here. So if you want to separate these two fillets, you cut along this way. Now, this part, the top part is more denser and the belly side is obviously more fatty. So the fatty things would be great for like curries um, because it doesn't dry out, won't flake as much. Whereas the, the, the top sides would be great for filleting, barbecuing, that kind of thing. Okay, so let's cut down here. And there we have it. So now what I can do, I can separate the bottom from the top. Again, by running my knife down the back of the bones and just lifting the flesh off. You know you're doing a good job where you can hear the bone. So I make an incision, cut down there. Open it up. There's one, and on the other side, you can see, we're just gonna do the same. I'll turn this over. You can see through here, we're just gonna cut down here. And that's it. Okay, so now I get my knife, and I run it down the back of the fish like this, putting a bit of pressure. Open it up. 
you need a sharp knife if you don't think your knife's sharp enough then just resharpen it because it makes the job so much easier this would be the same thing for doing something like a tuna or any other muscly fish like this And this one I'm going to hang over the side. This one I'm, I'm going to hang over the side and see what goodies we uh, we attract. So I'm going to tie it to the cleat like this. Drop it in. And if you hear lots of splashing behind me, you never know. Might even caught another fish. Okay. So the other thing we're going to do is we're going to skin the fish. Dead easy, but it can go wrong very quickly. So what we're gonna do is we have to have the blade on the board. So the next thing we're going to do is fillet the fish. Sorry, skin the fish. Uh, it's quite easy, but if you get it wrong, you take chunks of meat off. So it takes a bit of getting used to, a bit of technique. All we're gonna do is we're gonna run the blade along on the board. And as long as the blade is on the board or running against the board, the chances are we're gonna take more skin off the meat so I take a little slice off here, which allows me to, a little handle. I mean, this is not much good for anything. So we grab this side here and we start making a little incision like this. And we work along. Again, no rush. This hand is going left to right. And this other one is doing counter to it. So you see how we're doing like that? And the, see how the blade is, is kind of focused towards the board? Just like that. No rush. No rush. There's the skin. And there we go. This is obviously the fat of the fish, which is not a problem. It's perfectly okay to eat, but if you didn't fancy eating it, you run your blade along the back and trim it all off. But actually, there's a nice bit of flavour in this oily bit. Okay. And there we go. What are we doing now? Okay, we're going to cut it into nice portions. Mm -hmm. Don't lick me with your fish again. What now? What's this? So now we're going to cut it into portions. When I get my tweezers basically filleting it like this, you end up with about six bones here. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then they go into nothing here. So it's just these. Literally, basically, some tweezers and they'll pull straight out. is getting a first butchery lesson. First butchery lesson. And there we have it. So pretty much what I've got here, I've got some six beautiful steaks. I've got some nice loins. Um, and of course then all the belly and the smaller parts, it's not worth frying because there's nothing worse than going to a restaurant and getting skinny fillet fish. So uh, anything's not worth it, chop it into bits, into chunks, and fish kebabs, curries, something like that would be perfect. So there we go, that's our fish ready to get packed away and popped in the fridge. Enjoy. It's amazing that the piece of fish that I put over the side no longer than 10 minutes, uh, we attracted some beautiful nurse sharks. Uh, it's quite daunting to see them coming out of the depths, uh, but it can actually show you that these animals have got some crazy senses. I mean, we had this in the water for 10 minutes, and before you know, it's surrounded by 10 adult sharks. Um, I mean, it's, it was a crazy experience to see, and uh, a few minutes before, the kids were swimming in there. Of course, nurse sharks are relatively peaceful animals but uh, I think when you are feeding them there's always a danger that uh, you might get 
confused with the fish. But it was great to see. I mean, these gentle giants uh, certainly had a good bite of my uh, my fish. I mean, I had this fish on a big line, a big rope. Uh, maybe the knot wasn't so great, but it took it off within a couple of minutes, and um, they made little work of this uh, big carcass of fish surrounded. So yeah, yeah, I don't think you'd want to be in the water with them. Okay, well, where are we today? Today we are in Rudder Cut K, near Musha K, uh, in the Exhumits. And we have found out that David Copperfield, the magician, owns this island. And he has put a sculpture in the water called The Musician. Uh, basically, it is a mermaid with a full-size grand piano. Uh, it's only about four meters deep, so we're going to have a, a recce, see if we can find it. Uh, we don't know exactly where it is, but it's in the water and we just need to, half the, the fun is trying to find the thing. So um, we've got some cameras and we're going to go and see if we can find it. Hopefully we'll have some footage of us playing the piano. dinghy bitch. <laughs> yeah, if your dinghy bitch isn't going to be with you. <laughs> I think uh, I'll have to make Nathan my dinghy bitch. Nathan, come and get yeah, me. It's meant to be all like waist height water. But it is howling. It's howling. Look at this. Here's my ride. Here's my ride of crazies who want to go sailing, kiting. Phone safe. We're going kiting. Is it windy or what? This is really, this is going to be dangerous. <laughs> so this is Doug taking us kite surfing. <laughs> and he wants a beer. Well, yeah, he expects <laughs> maybe That's more right. than one. <laughs> It's a windy one, but it's beautiful. It looks amazing where we are. Uh, I'm a bit nervous, really, kind of sailing in this kind of wind, but uh, hopefully we'll have a bit of support. Safe, safe feel, damn base. We gon' shake up this place. Say, pick up, pick up. Stay winning is a mood to me. Hey, hey, I said. 